Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from different parts of the world. Thank you so much for joining us today in our Consumer Healthcare Training Academy webinar series, 2022 and beyond. Our today's topic is Modern Growth Playbook by Michelle Bottomley, a founder of Modern Growth Exchange. Today's marketers are working very hard to build purpose-led brands and end-to-end -end marketing experiences that engage and motivate consumers in ways that grow business and brand reputation. This competitive landscape requires chips from product-centric solutions to customer-centric solutions that integrate data, digital, branding, and insight in ways that better meet consumer needs. Today, we will learn a practical framework and tool set to help focus our teams on the right audiences to build relationships with them in modern ways. But before we start, I would like to encourage you to expand your mind by thinking about these four questions while listening to our presentation and discussion. What excites you? What concerns you? What would you like to know more about? and what ideas come to you while listening to our presentation and discussion. And if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, while listening to our discussion, please feel free to pop your questions in our chat box. Our team will put together your questions to ask our speaker and moderators during or at the end of the session. I'm so excited to introduce you to our speaker and moderators of the day. Michelle Bottomley. Michelle is the global executive and founder of the Modern Growth Exchange, the customer-centric the customer -centric company that enables clients to unlock their business growth by actionable insights and technology. With outstanding experience at global companies, Michelle's leadership has led several iconic businesses to grow by providing insight-driven solutions across diverse sectors including pharmacy, consumer packaged goods, and financial services. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's such a great pleasure to have you here with us today. And let's also welcome our moderators. Dev McCocken. Dev is a storyteller at Bibliosexual and a senior associate at the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. And last but not least, Steve Sowerby. Steve is the founder of Expotential and the co-founder of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. So please, everyone, help me welcome Michelle, Dave, and Steve. Hello, everybody. And uh, we're all over the world today. Uh, Michelle, Steve, I, AIM, we're on continents all over the world, um, coming to you at all sorts of different times. But for a very exciting session um, and something that's really close to me because those of you that know me know I've spent most of my career working in the advertising world and the brand development world trying to help brands grow and figuring out how to make that happen and so I think what Michelle's going to um, share with us today are some great frameworks to thinking about how that growth can occur so welcome Michelle I notice you're still on mute so hello uh, good. hi okay. good morning. <laughs> it's great to um, be here it's, yeah, it's really good to, to be part of this. Um, I know we're going to uh, take you, uh, you're going to take us through uh, some charts as always and some thoughts. But, you know, maybe can I just ask, and, and welcome, Steve. Oh, for those of you, you listening, Steve is stuck in quarantine in a hotel in England. And I think it's like the middle of the, the night there. So he, yes. he might fall asleep during the course of this. Oh, thank you very much, Dave. I will try. It's a really interesting topic. So that's going to keep me Let's awake. Let's not have Absolutely. that happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, listen, before we start going into Michelle's uh, deck, maybe, Michelle, you could just... Uh, somebody the other day, and I'm sorry, I forgot to warn you, I'm going to ask you this, but somebody <laughs> the other day, rather rather strangely to me, I was talking to a, a potential client about something, and I was I, I use the term, well, I guess the, the real thing you're asking is if I can help you figure out a way to grow your business in a slightly new direction. And he's, he said to me, what do you mean by growth? <laughs> now, it's a sort of ridiculously basic question. And maybe it was just because of the way he'd asked me, you know, that, but it's sort of, 
it led me to that sort of, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I almost felt like someone. What do you say to that? Go right. It, yeah. You know, it was one of those moments when you, and we've all had them, and not offending anybody, but, you know, you, sometimes you have those questions, you go, what are you, an idiot? And then you go, <laughs> but wait a minute, what, what is the answer to that, right? Yeah. So how would you answer that? Well, you know, what do you mean by growth? Well, that is a really good question, Dave. Um, growth is one of those wonderful elastic words that, that has a couple of different meanings in the way we're using it. We could talk about the growth of the business as you just did, but also so many businesses today are really purpose-led brands. They're getting to the yeah. heart of why they exist mm -hmm. and how they make the world a better place or how they help people live better lives. And so you could say that part of growth is helping that consumer to live the best life they possibly can because of the solutions or experiences that the brand provides. But the other way that I love to think about the word growth is people, you know, the human mm. beings that are bringing those brands to market um, every single day. And I think when we, we, we bring the concept all together, if if we can help the consumer live a better life because our people are so in tune with their needs that they're able to create solutions and mm. experiences that meet those needs better than anything out there, then that company is going to grow. And so it's, it's one of those cool words that, you know, kind of applies to people in three different settings. But um, yeah. we'll yeah. talk a little bit about that today. But would, would you have been able to give that answer to, to your clients and would they be interested in that kind of growth? Yeah, I think it's increasingly important. I think it's so much, uh, you know, the inspiration that we give people to believe in change and to do something about their lives is something for me, which is primary. Um, the, 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 let's call it the, the lagging uh, measures like sales and, and profit and what have you, that comes as a consequence of changing the way people think, feel and believe and therefore act. And therefore, you know, I think it's increasing in many organizations, they realize that they have to do that first before they yeah. can expect any of the more uh, functional measures of growth yeah i think that that was the i think that was the thing that came to me as well yeah uh, something that that michelle just mentioned that you know growth i think you know on one level growth is a purely functional thing and we think of it in terms of oh you mean numerically adding business or yeah. you know growing the you know growing the business in, in multiples of sales or something like that. But of course, in our personal lives, we talk, you know, those of us that are parents, we talk about that, you know, the growth of our children. We don't just mean mm. that they're getting taller. We mean as you know, their growth as human beings and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and we talk about that. And, you know, in brands, we now talk about the brand growing in terms of sales or market share, but we also to mean growth in terms of personality and, yeah. and, the fact that it is a more mature person and somebody who takes a, a brand that takes on responsibility and yeah i think that's where the you know it's the it's the beauty of the english language you know that you have those or so many words like that that have these multiple meanings but yeah anyway that's the starting oh, point so why don't we just use use that as a start and then michelle why don't you start taking us through the wisdom that you're going to provide us with today great thank you all right. Well, thank you very much for that, that great jumping off point. We're going, to, um, we're going to cover a few things today having to do with growth, as a matter of fact. Um, we're, we're, our aim is to help you understand this modern growth uh, skill set and tool set so that you can move beyond just deploying communications or building insights that lead to communications and, and instead focus on those consumers that really make or break a brand and understanding their needs so well that you're able to create and engineer solutions and experiences that, that help them live better lives and help the business grow. So we'll introduce to you what those skill sets are. We'll also provide you with a framework. And so, you know, framework is kind of a, a mental map, if you will, a way of thinking about growth planning. I know um, in some of my marketing leadership roles, uh, folks would do growth planning by taking last year's budget and tweaking it a little bit uh, up or down and the same thing with the numbers. But I think what you'll see in, in this growth framework is a way of 
of understanding the business as a set of relationships. And hopefully once you see the business and your work through that lens, it'll cause you to think a little bit differently about where you put priorities next year. So when you emerge from this, um, this next hour, I think you'll end up with not only a sense of the skills you need to succeed with modern marketing, but we're gonna do a deep dive on a couple of core topics here. And it really starts with this idea of not counting everyone you reach, but instead reaching the people that count. And those are these high value consumers that in my experience, make or break a brand. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, where that experience came from in a moment. How do you get to these people? Once you understand who they are, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have enough of these high value consumers to deliver the kind of business performance that we want? And if not, where are we going to find or grow them over time? And what's the role of evocative, engaging communications in appealing to these high value consumers in ways that uh, cause them to wanna to do business with us and consider us to be trusted, uh, indispensable advisors to them. And hopefully with this center point of, of knowledge and perspective, you will start your 2022 really, really strong. And let me give you just a little bit of background on the modern growth uh, exchange and why I put this training together. Um, as a marketing leader, I realized that the marketing profession has become incredibly fragmented. There are so many different types of marketing mm -hmm. practitioner. There are folks that think about the art of, of communications, of defining the brand's purpose and creating the communications that will engage the audiences, deploying campaigns and measuring their effectiveness. And there's the science of really um, understanding where these audiences are and building integrated contact strategies and experiences to go and reach them. But I built this um, modern growth playbook because I wanted to make sure that every marketer had the ability to think like um, the head of the marketing team, to be able to see that art and science so that they could pull the levers of growth for their business and they can progress in their career along the way. Yeah. So what I discovered at the very beginning of my career is something when I was 23 years old as an analyst that has stuck with me for the last 30 years. And Peter Drucker said it himself very well, the purpose of a business is to create and keep a customer. And in the beginning of my career, I, um, I analyzed customer data sets and I looked for uh, different segments of customers that were important to the company, either because they were delivering a, a lot of growth or because they were delivering a lot of loss to the company. Hmm. And that got me very curious about the fact that some customers are worth a little bit more than others. And by the way, when I say customer, I mean consumer. So that end user of your product, not the retailer, although we'll talk about them. Yeah. They're oftentimes a customer in the in-between, but I mean here this consumer. And so Peter Drucker said it, I think very well, that the factor of production of a profit is really that consumer. We have products and we have distribution to reach those consumers. But if we don't really understand those consumers that matter most, we're not gonna be able to deliver the kind of impact that we're hoping to have as a business. And I am, continuously uh, surprised at how many businesses are still so focused on the product and not the consumer. And that's why we've built this uh, modern growth playbook to be able to, to bring this into the center of the business. Um, now, the consumer is not a new concept. We've been, and, and I like this, this slide because it kind of goes back through time. And even though we say modern, this concept of modern growth or modern marketing has been around since the turn of the century, believe it or not. But at hmm. the time we thought about, you know, the product, the production of the product, you know, in the fifties timeframe, but then we, we became more curious about selling the product to consumers and how we would engage that consumer to buy more of the product through the selling process. As we moved into and beyond the fifties into the sixties through nineties and into the, the, the knots in 2020, it became more about marketing. How do we make sure that that consumer is at the middle of what we're designing and we're reaching that consumer in really relevant ways? But even in that marketing concept, we've oftentimes lost sight of that very consumer when it comes to our go-to-market. We're not always reaching those high value consumers that count. And so now we merge into 2020 and beyond and the concept that many or the philosophy that many organizations are focused on, particularly those that are digital brands, is societal. You know, it's really about 
how is the brand helping that target audience live a better life? How are they able to do more, be more, experience more because they have that brand as a trusted resource? Um, and so they're able to contribute more than they would have before. We're also seeing that in society, uh, the, the connectivity between people to provide advice, to provide guidance on which brands um, are fit for purpose or which ones aren't is an important part of the societal marketing concept. So I'm gonna stop and um, there, ask for a little feedback from, from you, the audience. When you look at these concepts, these philosophies, these ways of thinking about um, what is modern and how do we engage with the consumers that matter, what reflects your business? And we're gonna put up a poll. We'd love to see what your thoughts are. What world are you living in today? Because even though we're all standing in 2021, many organizations are still very much sales centric or marketing centric, or I dare say product centric, even though they might want to be thinking about the impact they make on the world. The whole infrastructure is very much geared around a very different philosophy. So we have, it looks like five possible responses. Is your company product or consumer centric? And so product centric is the product and moving more of the product is at the center of the organization or is it consumer centric? Is it some combination? Is it neither? It's something else. Maybe it's sales centric or is there some, some other answer? So if you guys could take a moment, I'm going to put my own answer in um, and we'll come back with a response. Okay. Thank you, Raju. I see purpose and performance are key drivers. Yes. <clears throat> Sounds like drivers of your business and, and drivers of the brand. Do you know, I was going to predict a little bit uh, that we're still in the 1950s in many of the organizations, Michelle, in terms of the philosophy of, of we've got a product and we've got to sell it. And um, even though we work with some of the biggest companies in the world, I increasingly uh, am, am seeing this uh, really going down to just the product level. Dave, do you, uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, a lot of companies are still doing it. I, I'm seeing companies, uh, maybe not the ones, maybe particularly in the, in the category that we're dealing with most in terms of healthcare, Steve, I think that's a rare thing mm. to be consumer centric. A um, couple of the projects you and I have worked on in the last year or two would indicate it's starting to change in terms yeah. of let's, you know, within a broad cat product category, let's think about a new way of thinking about that category. Yeah. And I'm always reminded about, you know, I always go on about this, but I'm reminded about my experience of working on the Coca-Cola brand for 25 years. That one of the first things I got told my very first visit to Atlanta was they don't sell a drink. Mm. They, they, sell, they, they sell a solution, yes. right? They sell a thing that allows you to feel better about life. It just happens to come in a bottle, right? Yeah. Um, and I thought oh, that's always stuck with me is I, that that's not product centric, right? We we they're thinking that way, but yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of there's still a lot of work to be done in that in that sense. Yeah, as, of, as I say, yeah, definitely in in the consumer healthcare area. Um, you know, we've been obsessed with selling the pill, the potion. Well, to, to a different thing, I'm, to yeah. a different thing I'm working on, you know, again, uh, the project I referred to the other day, but um, trying to explain to a client that a briefing doesn't involve the formula. Yes. So when you're briefing the, the marketing agency or the, or the advertising agency, the details of the formula are not the most important thing, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's why would people want this? What yes. difference is it going to make to somebody's life? Yeah. Um, is the important thing to know. Yeah. And we still have an awful lot of problems where people get so hung up on, you know, the intricacies of the way they've made the product or the intricacies of, of course. you know, yeah. formulation, uh, instead of thinking bigger about, no, no, but what issue does it really solve? You know, no, uh, it, how it is it going to make it, that brings up a really interesting point, Dave, as you said, it's the issue that's being solved. And, and when do you ask the consumer about that? Is it you know, when you're creating the product in the beginning and then communicating yeah. it? And is that it? I, I was on the board of one company and um, I asked them, who's buying this product? And they didn't know. 
So mm. are we consumer centric? Well, yes, of course we do all this research before we build the products. And then we do research on the communications to see if it resonates with them. Yes, but who yeah. is buying the product and are they buying multiple products from us mm. to solve something? And is there education we can provide to them to, to, to make the products even more effective? Mm -hmm. And it, in a way it's looking through the opposite end of the telescope. Instead of looking product out, and only talking to the consumer at the beginning and the end. Yeah. It's starting with that consumer and it's really getting a sense of, well, gosh, how are they consuming this product? How many of them are buying it on a frequent basis? And can I even look at my business economics that way? So yeah, that I'm sure yeah, exactly. that the, the consumers that well, I'm talking with. Is that, is, that are they, is the group of people that are consuming your product, the people you thought were going to be consuming it, you know? Yeah. Um, because quite often it's not, it's somebody else, right? Um, and it's amazing to me how many companies, even when they're doing ongoing uh, research with, with people, they keep on researching the people they thought were going to be buying this and not necessarily the ones that are buying it. Yeah. And, you know, and this, um, this is why we're, we're talking, having this conversation today, because so much marketing, despite all the technology and the data and the digital and the power of brands and purpose-led brands, is marketing to the average, right? We look yeah. at an age, an income level, education level, et cetera, when most brands on the planet are driven by 20% of the consumers driving 80% yes. of the revenue Correct. or profits. And yet, if you ask that brand, how many high value consumers are in the category and what share of them do you have? That's not a question we always answer. And that becomes so important as you start layering in digital if we're yes. still marketing on to the average and we're not really yep. surrounding these, what we'll call high value consumers mm. and understanding them and creating solutions that are going to meet their needs. We could have the best yeah, exactly. product, but it's not going to necessarily meet the needs of those that are going to disproportionately drive the category volume. Yeah, exactly. And a really, really good question from Jim that's uh, in the, in the Q and a, um, you know, are we seeing that companies that are more consumer centric, are they gaining more uh, disproportionate share from others? So do we see them really, really uh, growing very strongly? And I think I think we have done in the past and we will do in the future. I mean, Apple is one that really comes to mind immediately about, you know, someone who the, a, a company that is very consumer centric in the way it communicates of course it's got very strong and wonderful design products but they're not technically the best products on the market and yet apple has certainly a disproportionate share of the emotional um uh of the emotions of of, of its consumers so uh yes i think i think very much if we're able to really inspire those 20 percent of the total consumers wow, you will grow your business disproportionately. And when I was at, um, as part of the WPP family, <clears throat> when I was at Ogilvy, they, they have a brand Z uh, study, I'll say, uh, since you're in England, yes. Steve. Yes, uh, thank you. And, and we used to do analyses across CPG, consumer healthcare, every category that the consumer was in. And we invariably found not only that, um, there's an 80-20 rule. And sometimes it's 20, 50, you know, 30, 60, whatever it may be, but a small concentration yeah. driving the majority. But we also found that the number one brand in every category had the majority of the high value consumers in that category. Mm, and that's key. And so if, 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 as you look at digital and as we look at communications and experiences in this, this economy, um, understanding who these folks are with insights um, is is going to be key, especially if you're not number one. If you're trying to get that coveted spot, yeah, absolutely. I think we should uh, we should move on because there's lots yeah. of really really yes. great uh, material. And speaking uh, of digital, just, yes, yeah. indeed. So so digital is is exploding as we know. Digital transformation has been in the works for at least a decade. I think I started practicing digital in the late '90s and. Um, back when we were doing demo disks and emails and websites that, that didn't look very good by today's standards. But digital transformation spending is only gonna to continue to grow. And that's not just digital you know, hardware, it's also software. 
And why? Because businesses want to future-proof themselves. They want to make sure that they're going to be around tomorrow for the next decade. And boards especially will support CEOs and chief information officers in, in, in making these investments with the hope that they're going to turn out great value. Mm-hmm. And you can see here that you know, the CAGR for digital transformation is going to continue to grow with an 18% CAGR over the next couple of years and ultimately reach over $2 uh, trillion dollars, um, globally in spend, which is extraordinary when you think about where we were just you know, back in 2017. Has your company invested in digital technologies and services um, for your organization? So I'm going to assume that your company has uh, invested in digital since so many companies have. What we're seeing when we look at the research is, and, and we work across different organizations, that even though companies have made enormous investments in digital, it's not delivering. 80% of the investments when executives are asked are not delivering the value that's expected. If we go to this next slide, what does drive revenue growth is digital maturity. And what do we mean by that? We mean that the organization has figured out how to become mature in its use of digital to create experiences and to work collaboratively. And when they have digital maturity, they create growth for the organization. And so um, we're going to, to go to the next slide. Good. What drives digital maturity? Well, there are, it turns out, seven different pivots according to a couple of consulting organizations. I picked this one for the purpose of today's conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, there are three of them that, that account for 50% of the revenue growth, if you can get this right. So let me just sort of back up and make sure everyone's tracking with us because we've been flipping on the slides around quite a lot. Digital is big, companies are investing in it. They will continue to invest in it for the years to come. Most digital is not producing the business impact that was expected. Of those companies that are getting the business impact, they do a handful of things really, really well. One of those things is data mastery. They figured out how to turn their data into insights and into actions that drive growth. Another Mm -hmm. is that they're actually able to have um, unified customer experiences that make a difference. And um, the third that really matters is this open talent network, meaning the folks that are smart about how to use data, digital, and technology are able to come in and out of the organization and their current staff are able to be trained. So now we're gonna show you the poll and ask you which of these different levers um, for commercializing the investments in digital are your organizations focused on? And I'm, re- I'm secretly hoping that one or two of the ones that are in boxes pop out. While Reference. we're waiting, I think um, one of the really interesting things is, you know, the investment that's required in many of these digital companies, Michelle, um, because um, you'll see in, in a number of these uh, very, very large digital organizations that they continue to invest at a loss for years. Uh, engaging their consumers, bringing them on board in some cases uh, for free. So they're, you know, li- very limited revenue. And yet the company continues to grow and attract more and more investment, even though every day it's burning, uh, you know, uh, tremendous amounts of, of cash in the event that it reaches a critical mass and then starts to uh, bring in more revenue uh, generating uh, elements to its business, you know. So uh, that sounds a lot like Amazon, Steve. <laughs> Amazon, <laughs> but not every company can can do that. Spotify, and it's just yes. amazing how they're able. Uh, Grab Foods, for example, um, you know, a tremendous investment all the time. Um, is that going to be part of the formula now going forward? If we launch a digital company, we're going to have to, pre- you know, prepare for years of loss before we, uh, we make any money. I don't think that every company has um, a charismatic founder that's able to explain <laughs> to, to the street why it has consecutive quarters of, of loss, um, the, the way the example that you just gave does. Yeah. So, so the rest of us that have to actually deliver um, growth from these investments have to figure a couple things out. Which levers are we going to bet on? Because invariably, it's not about the technology. I mean, we even see this with Amazon or Spotify. It is about the people and the process Mm. as much Mm. as it is about Mm. the technology. So when you look at this box around data mastery, 
that's people skill, right? And mm -hmm. it's obviously also the process of integrating your data uh, so that you have one single version of the truth. You can see that HVC, that high value consumer. Yeah. You're not gonna see it if your data is all over the place in 10 different data stores. And if sales has an interaction or if that consumer comes onto your website or you have the ability to see their purchase or consumption data from a retailer or distributor, you wanna have that all in one place. Yes. And, and so that requires not just talent, but process. And so I think, Steve, I, I, gone are the days where companies could write big checks for the, for the tools. Yeah. And uh, now it's even more important that the people and the processes are in place around the three levers we're seeing here. Okay, we, we thank you very much, Jane. We've got our poll results in. Yeah. So the question was, which digital maturity pivots are most important for growth? And it looks like once again, we've got just uh, three areas, data mastery being one of them, the ecosystem engagement and the unified customer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great because um, I, I just did a study actually that sound, found very similar to results to what is coming up on this poll that um, the technology, it used to be we were buying CRM systems, marketing automation, content management systems, you know, whether it was Salesforce or Adobe, et cetera, to drive these personalized experiences. And in a study I just conducted with 30 chief marketing officers, chief commercial officers, chief digital officers um, in multinational companies, what they said is limiting growth is the um, operational alignment. So I can see that in this ecosystem mm. comment is that everyone has the same North Star. Everyone understands what are we solving for? Oh, we're trying to get more high value consumers. Okay, whether I'm in product or finance or customer service or marketing <clears> or sales, <throat> let's go after that. And the second is that people are able to work together with operational alignment against this experience. That end to end consumer experience is kind of the new platform with which sales, marketing and all the other functions are, are collaborating to drive common goals. And so it's interesting that our, our, our folks here today are seeing what these leaders of big um, multinational marketing and, and digital teams are seeing as well, which is we've got to get this right. And it's, it tends to be a common understanding or a common mindset that's most needed to get this right. Indeed. All right. So why do we have to get this right? Let's go to the next slide because these companies, such as the one you mentioned, the Amazons of the world, the retailers, and we'll give you some examplars in a moment, yeah. are using the data and the digital and the technology. Those that are up at stage five in this digital maturity curve, who have that common mindset, who, who know about HVCs and are, are solving for the needs of those high value consumers and their experience and their solutions, are using data, artificial intelligence, and technology to deliver always on growth engines. What do I mean by that fancy language? I mean personalization before, during, and after your shopping experience. It could be through a mobile device with geo-targeting that you're receiving content or information. It could be before you even left the house and you're inside of your digital ecosystem that you're receiving mm -hmm. education or information. And it might even be a point of sale or after that that relationship is continuing to, to, um, to be persistently there. And if our retailers are uh, advanced in the practice of connecting the dots between high value consumers, the experience they have and these enabling modern tools, we need to be there to at least in mindset so that we can harvest some of the data and the insights that they have to get to place our brands in that consumer journey. Um, as, as it unfolds. I just said a lot, but yeah. you know, it's important to know, you know what the exemplars are doing as they're building these personalized experiences because our brands live in those ecosystems yeah. and that gives us unique ability to develop insights. Oh, a high value consumer is just you know, engaged with Tesco or with Netflix. This is what they're consuming or with Amazon. Here's what abandoned items are in their cart. Hmm, let's get curious about that so that we can move um, our relationship forward in there. So this is, these always on growth engines are producing a lot of digital signal mm -hmm. um, or information that can make us smarter about not just the average consumer, but those high value consumers and the brands that understand them and, and are reaching, engaging them through um, channels and experiences the best as we talked about are going to be the ones that, that um, 
yeah. that went in the category. So I'm not suggesting you all quit your jobs and go and work for these companies. <laughs> but I am suggesting that um, the mental model that we're going to go through, which is the one these organizations think yeah. about, is one that you understand and start to adopt as part of your superpower. Yeah. Michelle, would you, would you say that, I mean, at the moment, we, we're, we're overwhelmed by data, uh, much more than we used to be in the good old days where we had to have, you know, one Nielsen report and make huge decision based on that, whereas we've got data coming in from all sorts of places. So we are data rich. Um, we are uh, insight rich when it comes to sort of uh, insights which can be directly translated, you know, by artificial intelligence or uh, effectively, um, you know, what uh, what data is telling us. But would you would you uh, agree that we're also insight poor when it comes to the emotional insights that we get from that data, the connection to people's hearts and minds? Um, as marketers, we've been trained much more just to read the numbers and act on the numbers, whereas what I find in many organizations is that they're afraid to go beyond that into the emotions and try and effectively see the world from the shoes or the eyes of the, uh, of the, the consumer that they're talking to, yeah. the high value consumer. Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, look at the story of Netflix as a perfect example of what you're yeah. saying, Steve. I remember back in the day, Netflix used to be on a disc. Yes. And we, you know, would pay $10 or whatever it was um, to receive whatever movies we picked out for that week. And Netflix, because they got into understanding what role they played, what the cognitive connections were with these high value consumers, they understood that it's about entertainment, it's about family night or date yeah. night, that they were able to change the form factor from a DVD into broadband. Obviously they took advantage of it. Now they're creating amazing content yeah, that amazing. is incredibly attractive to the high value consumer. So I think these digital brands really figured something out, particularly those with subscription models, mm -hmm. that, that their business is a portfolio of relationships. And if they yeah. really understand the hearts and minds of these high value consumers and where they live in their, in their lives, then they're able to create experiences for them that, that are beyond just having access to a, a movie, but instead become part of their lives on an everyday basis. It's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of interesting that, you, you, that when you think about a lot of these companies, right, and those companies that are growing so exponentially, et cetera, et cetera, one of the side issues that we sometimes forget is all of those companies employ anthropologists. Many of them have their own anthropology department. Um, and so it's not just about numeric driven data, it's about anthrop literally anthropology to understand uh -huh. the cultural nuances of the people that are participating in that brand, right? Yes. Uh, and what are, the, what are the, the cultural factors that lead to that participation? Um, and I found that really interesting over recent years to, as I've been involved with some discussions and work with some of those, in, as they call them, brand anthropologists or industrial anthropologists. Um, but it's taking a very different approach from just, oh, it's just numbers, right? So it's, yeah. it's bringing all that together and then understanding how to move that forward. Yes, well, let's keep cracking on yeah, because we're exactly. gonna to get to the art and science bit of this because you're exactly right, Dave, that um, <clears throat> we have to be, as growth leaders, super curious about, if we flip to the next slide, um, not just the products we have, but importantly, the consumers, the hearts, the minds, the behaviors of the consumers that are going to drive a disproportionately share, disproportionately high share of the category value. And, and there is a movement afoot. We still have a world where there are classically trained marketers that are product centric, they're thinking about product sales and communications, not necessarily experiences. They might say experiences, but it shows up as an ad or a website and not really a whole fulsome experience. They're looking at individual channels. And in fact, if you looked at the marketing departments, most of the marketing departments I've led have had individual silos of channels. The mail team and the web team and the TV team mm. were all in different places. It didn't really have the consumer at the center to create the 360 degree surround. The performance analytics they looked at were about reach and frequency and click-through rates. I remember one company I worked with 
um, we looked at what was coming in. It was the number four largest e-commerce company in the United States. And we found that 40% of the traffic that was coming in were not people that were going to deliver mm. revenue or profit for us. So counting clicks is not really helpful if you're bringing in folks that, are, that don't have the dollars or they're coming in on discount. And then individuals tending to well-established channel, that is the, the mindset of a classically trained um, marketeer, as opposed to this modern growth engineer. And you don't have to work in Netflix or any of these dot-com companies to have this mindset to really keep that consumer at the center of everything you do to think about, do I have enough of these plump and juicy high value consumers to grow my business? Do I need to acquire more of them, expand the relationship with them or retain them? And what is it gonna take for me to get those three things to happen? How do I think about media, not one channel at a time, but as a 360 surround? And I get smart about growth intelligence from in-market insights, not just behavior, but as Steve and Dave were saying, this, the mindset, the attitude, and where the brand lives in that consumer's lives. And am I working as part of a collaborative go-to-market team powered by data, digital, and content so that we show up as one brand that's, that's helping the consumer along the journey, moving more of the right consumers into purchase? And are we agile? Can we see results and then move quickly uh, based on what we're seeing? So I'm going to challenge all of us to, to adopt the modern growth engineer mindset. And by the way, for everyone, you will receive a copy of the presentation at the end Indeed. and uh, you'll be able to go through it. And I'm going to offer when we get to the last slide of the presentation, which happens to have modern growth exchange on it, the first five people that put their name in, I'm willing to spend 30 minutes with you individually to talk about anything here or your specific situation so that you can really take on these tool sets and mindsets yourself. But this modern marketing, um, modern engineer mindset is an art and science continuum. Gone are the days that you could just be a brand person or, oh no, I'm just a go-to-market person. Or you know what? I'm a digital person. This modern growth leader has to flex to both sides of this continuum and figure out which combination of these tools is gonna to be right to surround this, this, um, this high value consumer and reach them where they go online and offline for inspiration, education, and to purchase. We've talked a lot about high value consumers. Let's dive into it. Yeah. This is going to look, um, next slide, a bit like an image that uh, you probably have a mental picture of in the next mm -hmm. slide again. Uh, these category best consumers. These are the 80-20 rules or the 15%, 60% you can see here. In this first triangle, we have the number of consumers. And the second triangle, we have the revenue. And if none of you have done this calculation, I really encourage you to do it for your business. It's super easy. You just need the number of consumers and then you need the amount of revenue that they're throwing off. And then you can figure out for pretty much through, we call it a gains chart, you know, where you have to stop to get to you know, your 15 or 20% and what that looks like for you. There are also ways of figuring it out for your category. And if you don't have the data yourself, attitude and usage studies are quite helpful for this. But in order to um, grow, understanding these high value consumers is super important. And so here's the playbook. It's super simple. It has mm -hmm. at the center consumer growth and it's powered by the art of purpose-led branding, really being the go-to brand with experiences that simplify the cons and, and improve the consumer's life because we're understanding the needs of that consumer, particularly the high value consumer. And it's the science of with precision like targeting, being able to acquire, expand and retain more of the categories, high value consumers than the competition. And increasingly this is coming on through personalized experiences across multiple touch points. So um, why are we talking about uh, this, this, um, this cycle, what we call a relationship cycle? Because as important as it is to understand who the high value consumer is, what makes them tick, what needs are being satisfied by the brand, whether it's the experience or the full solution. It's also important to run the numbers and to understand to what degree do the high value consumers know about me? Are they aware of me? Are they considering me? Are they engaged with us? Are they purchasing? Are we retaining them? And are they advocating our brand to other people? And what I find um, brands that are, uh, really engineering for growth are those that are 
not afraid to look at these numbers and to just rough out a growth model such as this and map their programs and then their channels to this kind of a model. And then to look at how many new consumers do I need? How many, much expansion do I need? And how much retention in order to achieve or exceed the growth targets that we have? So notice that on this diagram, the channels are not first, the people are first and the phases of the relationship they go through. And, you know, programs that move them not all the way around this cycle, but from awareness to consideration, what does that look like today? And you can see in this example, well, you have 200,000 individuals that are high value consumers that are aware of this brand and 40% of them would consider them and 20,000 of them are now engaged with us today. 10,000 are buying from us, 8,000 are gonna continue buying from us. And about 7,000 of these folks are going to go ahead and refer us to others. So that's a very loyal base indeed. By understanding this kind of a model, and this model is in by, by the way, this is the way financial services and subscription businesses run their business. You can build programs, you could do what if scenarios, you can see whether or not you're able to achieve the numbers that you've outlined in this plan. And importantly, you're then looking at the channel effectiveness in the context of not just that channel, but now that channel's ability to move people from one box to the next effectively, yeah. not just by itself, but collectively. Yeah. Michelle, there was a question really on that topic of awareness uh, before the, the webinar. Uh, what, are, what kind of possibilities do we have for digital channels to create awareness on the topic of consumer health care or self-medication in the in the uh, in the more positive uh, definition of that that word, which is uh, you know uh, you know buying your uh, pain relief from the from the chemist and and using it and good health, um, you know what kind of possibilities do we have to do that through the digital space? Enormous possibilities. And if we can flip forward, there's a bubble chart that has mm. a gal called Sheila on it. And instead of giving you a list, there we go. Thank you. Oh, there's Sheila. Hey. There's Sheila. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's less about the channels that, a, that I might give you. And it's more about what your HVC, where they're going for ideas and inspiration. Sheila is representative hmm. of a high value consumer. So when you're really practicing consumer centricity, you're going to get super curious about Sheila, mm -hmm. who is that 20% driving 80% of your value. And where the devil is Sheila going every day? Look at that. Sheila's interested in travel. Where else mm. is Sheila interested in fashion, celebrity gossip? This is Sheila's world, cooking, entertainment. You can see in the little dots, the digital properties, but also the not digital properties that she is looking at on a regular basis, self and home improvement, business, politics, et cetera. So I think the answer to this question is, yes, of course, there are digital platforms. But if you're trying to reach Sheila, it's super important that you understand where is Sheila? going for ideas and education. How do you mm. show up in Sheila's world? Yeah. And not enough marketeers are doing that. So many marketeers are, are sort of thinking about one channel at a time instead of standing in the shoes of the HVC Sheila in this case yeah. and looking at the ecosystem that she's consuming and make sure that you're showing up in those places with ideas and inspiration. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, we do make the mistake often only at looking at Sheila when she needs our product. Or, you know, and that's it. We look at that micro uh, th as a, through a microscope into her life and look purely for that moment and right. think that that's it. But, you know, we really need to understand her as a person, not just as a consumer of yeah. our product. Well, that, and Steve's hit on it. That's why Steve knows I bore people with the fact I actually don't ever like talking about the word consumer. Yeah. Because too often I hear companies or people in marketers talking about our consumers. And what they really mean is that somebody who is actually, you know, they think it's their life revolves around their product or their service. And it doesn't, right? I mean, no matter what you are, the, the, the brand or product you're the biggest fan of is a tiny, tiny fraction of your life, right? Mm. So, and what I've also found, this is why I love charts like this, because it's a reminder that yes, I might, be ma I might be manufacturing uh, pain relief. But you know what? Pain relief doesn't actually have to be messaged just at times when people have pain or places people go to for pain relief information. 
it's got to be what else are they interested in where could it where could it be relevant right yeah um i always remember there was a there was some famous ads back here in australia many many years ago uh when digital first got started and what they started doing it was actually for um uh barocca you know what barocca is yeah it's like a uh, vitamin and, and in australia supplement. barocca yeah. famously has been sold for decades as a hangover cure right <laughs> so so what they did quite cleverly was they put it on cooking sites right and they put they tied it into cooking sites where people went to learn recipes because the, the the idea was well if you're going to make dinner and you're having a dinner party you're probably going to have a few drinks and then after a few drinks you better have a barocca um <laughs> And I just thought that was really clever because that's what people were interested in was the cooking sites to learn to what to cook for a, a great dinner. Yeah. And then and that's that exactly it. That's it. Yeah. Now we call it contextual marketing. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's all because you're standing in the shoes of that consumer and you're looking right. at where they're going for ideas and inspiration and how do I show up as part of the solution for a great experience. Remember back to Netflix, if you're part of date night or family you know, night, you're, you're creating that experience. Well, let's move on to this next yes, slide. Yes, absolutely. Because um, I also want to make sure that those people that want to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, have a chance to do this. I love this image. This image is a banyan tree. Do you know how long banyan trees live? 200 to 300 years. Mm -hmm. And why do banyan trees live that long? Because they have incredibly deep roots. And those deep roots allow them to have more branches and to live that longer life. Mm -hmm. And what we've talked about today is to establish the deep roots, especially in this digital data rich and technology rich world of understanding your high value consumer and understanding whether or not your business is attracting, retaining and growing enough of them in order to make sure that your investments in marketing or other growth initiatives are actually driving profitable revenue growth for your business and that you're not seen as an expense, but instead as a driver of growth. So, I get excited, not just about banyan trees, but imagining that in 2022, your business has found a way to get a higher share of high value consumers. Your average revenue per consumer is up. You and your team are enthusiastic about understanding high value consumers and pulling these growth levers to see the impact. Your entire organization is curious about this and in fact, want to work together to collaborate on growing and retaining as many of these HVCs as possible which I think is really cool. And you have common metrics. It's not just a click-through rate. It's how do we get more of these plump and juicy mm -hmm. consumers into our portfolio? And you and your team are seen as indispensable because you're bringing insights and growth to the organization that transcends any of the channel expertise or any of the programs or campaigns that you might've learned how to develop. So if you go to the last slide. Excellent. Um, we're not gonna talk about the modern growth maturity, but I will give this to you. And there is a question at the bottom asking where you are now and where you are tomorrow. Yeah. Do make sure you have a look at this because it's, it's not bad. Most companies I've worked for have been at step, stage one or two. They've aspired to be at stage four, but only in knowing where you are in this modern growth game, can you put the right steps into place to create the vision for the future and to actually get there. So what would be uh, your three key messages back to the industry and uh, especially the, the, uh, the participants of this particular webinar? Michelle? Thank you, Steve. I would say the first is to really start taking on board the skills needed to be a successful modern growth leader and that mindset as well. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, to get into understanding and reaching high value consumers with engaging and evocative communications that like Sheila are part of her world with that 360 surround. And last but not least, have a vision for growth. Know where you are and where you wanna go so that you and your organization can be as strong and as long living as that banyan tree that we saw. Great, thank you so much. That's great. And then That's lastly, great. Yep. You'll see in the presentation that the Modern Growth Exchange um, is um, available to, to help and support you. So my email address is in the, the back. And if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, I'm happy to provide that for you as well. Absolutely. No, this is really interesting. I, I think the structure thing is the important thing. And I think that's why everybody wants to get the charts because it's just great to have those sort of structural models to sort of rethink about. 
Um, we see a lot of, um, you know, stuff on LinkedIn and Facebook and everybody's making comments. And one of the things I get frustrated with on the LinkedIn experience is tons and tons of comments on a bunch of the issues you've raised, but actually all of that is just thought bubbles without any actual structure or flow mm. or, you know, and then people, in, as is that we always complain about today in the social media world of today, everybody rambles on and races out with an opinion without actually having anything that it's based on. So I think this is become, going to become a really great uh, base for everybody that's listened to this session. Yeah. So, you know, I learned something from it. I, I think I'm going to come back to you with some more questions later on the show and we'll have another discussion and uh, see where we can go with it. Thanks very much for the time. Yes, thank you, Michelle. It's always a pleasure to uh, to share time with you. And every time we do, I'm always learning something new. So uh, I hope that uh, the participants also take inspiration from this. Uh, no matter the size of the business, you can be a very large business and have availability of lots of data and apply these concepts. But similarly, if you're a small business, you can conceptually apply many of these uh, areas and uh, using what data is available, which believe me, in this day and age, actually, we have access for a lot of data uh, from many different sources. Um, and, and therefore, you know, applying this kind of mindset as the modern growth engineer is, uh, yeah. is really uh, important. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve, Michelle, and Deb. Thank you so much, um, especially Michelle for joining us today and for sharing insightful stories inside practical framework and tool with us but before we part today i would like to invite you all to join our next webinar series under the topic of self-care doesn't mean no care by trevor gore our senior advisor and trainer at the consumer healthcare training academy on the 24th of november um, in this session we will learn about the dynamics of self-care market the roles of pharmacists in this um, digital era and in this self-care trend that we were talking about and what the future of self-care looks like. We hope to see you all again in our next webinar. If you cannot make it, sign up anyways so that we can ensure you will receive the recording from the session. And you all will receive the recording and the presentation from this session. Finally, on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, I would like to invite you all to find us on LinkedIn and to continue a conversation and discussion. We look forward to seeing you in November. We wish you a wonderful day and the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you so much.